That's a typhoon starting. A thunderstorm over a warm ocean. First one storm, then another. Each gaining strength as warm air from these storms combined with warm air rising from the water's surface. Under the right conditions, they soon merge into one massive, terrifying storm, a Category 5 typhoon. Travelling at wind speeds of up to 250 kilometres per hour, the superstorms rip apart our homes and pummel our cities. And there's another reason to fear typhoons. Along the coast, powerful winds can push the water onto shore, leading to a rise in sea level. It's called a storm surge, and it causes massive flooding. What you saw on your screens was created from my imagination. But for millions of people in Southeast Asia, deadly typhoons are a terrible reality. And as global warming heats up our oceans, they will become more intense, unpredictable and deadly. I'm Jonal Puducherry, a politician and a father of three. Twin identities that push me to want to confront one of the biggest challenges facing our country and the planet, climate change. In this episode, I take a deep dive into one of the major contributors to climate change, plastic. Yeah, that's disgusting. Yeah, and that's 10 minutes or less. But curbing our addiction to plastic feels like an impossible task. It, it smells like garbage. It's like almost like rotting food. We've really enjoyed the convenience of this, but it just appears excessive. Can you guess how long it takes Singapore to use this number of plastic bags? I'm finding out what we must do. When do we have to get started? Ten years ago. After all, this is our plastic problem. Plastic was invented in 1869, and it was first used to make this, a billiard ball. These used to be made out of elephant ivory. Back then, billiards was a very popular game, and the slaughter of wild elephants couldn't keep up. People at the time praised the invention, plastic, saying this new material would protect nature from the destructive forces of human need. The irony is that plastics have now become one of the key reasons why our natural world and our climate are under threat. From cutlery to disposable shopping bags to packaging, plastic has become the superhero of modern life. Here's a staggering statistic to consider. In every single minute, one million plastic drinking bottles are sold around the world. So in five seconds... That's about 80,000 plastic bottles sold. Singapore's love affair with plastic started in the boom years of the 1960s. This was a time of nation-building industrialization. Plastics were an engine of growth and increasing wealth spurred a nation of consumers. At the time, plastic was only beginning to enter our everyday lives. It was still so novel, it even made the news. There's no doubt about it, the invention of plastics has been welcomed by every housewife. Light in weight, easy to keep clean, difficult to break or chip, completely safe for children and available in gay colours. There seems no end to the long list of products 
that can be made from plastic. In the decades since, we've come a long way in inventing new uses for the wonder material. As I'm about to find out, these days, plastic has permeated our lives in ways that I'm not aware of. I really liked science when I was at school, especially biology. It's one of the reasons I became a doctor. I enjoyed chemistry as well, but I don't remember learning very much about plastics. So I wonder what I'll learn from Donald Coe today. He has spent 16 years revealing the secrets of A-level chemistry to 17 and 18-year-olds. This should be interesting. Jano, can you identify the items with plastic in this fridge? Uh, sure. Well, this uh, mineral water, clearly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, these uh, slices of cheese, the yes. packaging as well as around each slice. This uh, yogurt as well, right? I mean, yes. the top is sort of foil of some sort, on but the foil, plastic probably. is on the packaging. That's right. Okay. Okay, but uh, you actually missed one. Uh, okay. You missed this. The can? Yeah. Let me tell you what I've done. Mm -hmm. I removed the paint from this aluminum drink can mm -hmm. and I've submerged it in concentrated sodium hydroxide for two hours. Let's take a look at what's left behind. Huh, I can see through. Yes. Huh. So this is actually the plastic inside the can. Why is there plastic in the can? In a carbonated drink like this, it has carbonic acid, and the carbonic acid can actually react with the aluminium. Mm -hmm, all right? Mm -hmm. Plastic's actually chemically inert, so it actually can protect the drink from the can and the can from the drink. That I'm very familiar with from my previous profession. We would get through several in a day. All right. So actually, uh, surgical masks are actually made largely by uh, polypropylene, which is also a plastic fibre. So our consumption of these must have gone up quite considerably in the pandemic. So uh, that's not good. Not good. But uh, in fact, this is even worse. Pandemic or no pandemic, we're using lots of wet wipes. Yeah, it's largely plastic. One last thing mm. I want to show you. OK. Come with me. There's so much plastic, we don't even know we're using. Just when I think it can't get worse, Donald has one more item to show me. Well, why don't you try uh, to put this a big block of styrofoam and fit it into this beaker? <laughs> this whole block into that beaker? Yes, right. Holy cow, look at that. Oops. So there's lots of bubbles. Yep. And it's falling apart as I feed it in. Yeah. It's like it's eating it up. This is actually acetone, all right? right. So it's actually a solvent for nail polish. Acetone breaks down the styrofoam, releasing the air. What is revealed is polystyrene. It's the chemical name for styrofoam and a type of plastic. So that's the plastic with all the air removed. That's right. It's kind of like, whoa, difficult to, to manipulate like this. It's like a goo. Look at that. That's quite amazing. I do feel like a kid again. <laughs> it's estimated that in the last 65 years, humans produced 8 billion tonnes of the stuff. That's more than one tonne of plastic for every person alive today. But our love of the material comes at an increasing cost to our climate and to our children. Nearly all plastic comes from fossil fuels. When we extract oil, a global warming, air-polluting gas called methane is produced. We use energy and release greenhouse gases when making plastic. We release methane, carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide. And we continue to do so when we transport the products to the shops. At our current rate of production, by 2050, it's calculated that carbon emissions from the entire plastic life cycle will triple. From a climate perspective, the worst offenders are single-use plastics. Why? Because their lifespan is so brief. On average, we use them for six months before throwing them away. But these disposables make up 40% of all the plastic we produce. But beyond manufacturing, there is another climate consequence to our plastic binge. A 
I've come to Lazarus Island, south of Singapore, with Lim Tech Kun, founder of conservation group Small Chain. You ready? Yeah, when you invited me for a beach cleanup, this is not what I expected. In this murky water, it takes a while for my eyes to adjust. But I soon discovered, to my horror, plastic. That's disgusting. Yeah, and that's 10 minutes or less. I wasn't even aware of the light, marine life. I was just aware of all the plastic and all the trash and all the bits that were there. It was, ooh, well. Yeah. Okay, so what have we got here? So this is just have... like some random plastic bag. Jeez. Yeah, probably some food packaging. Blah. Got bubble tea. How do you know that was? How do you know that was bubble? Oh, I see. No, no, it is right. You're right. So you like a uh, cheese biscuit? Okay. Okay. So, from the littering, we have a pollution problem. Yes. But what's that got to do with climate change? One of the concerns we have here is that as plastic goes into the ocean with our tropical climate, it degrades and, or rather, it breaks down very quickly uh, into microplastics. Yeah. And when it breaks down, um, there is a concern of whether there will be releases of greenhouse gases or also other orga organic contaminants. OK. Now, these organic contaminants will then possibly affect um, biodiversity in the ocean. Biodiversity matters because it affects the ocean's ability to act as a carbon sink. A carbon sink absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And a big part of why our oceans can function that way is phytoplankton. These are tiny plant-like organisms that make up barely 2% of Earth's green matter. But they absorb, through photosynthesis, an astounding 40% of the world's carbon each year. The worry is that microplastics in the ocean can harm these phytoplankton, even kill them. It is actually a circular problem because when you have climate change and then your oceans start to get warmer, yes. the ability of it to be a sink is also affected. Why? Because as you get warmer and warmer, and you have more and more carbon in the atmosphere, the ocean becomes acidified. So we have a, a link between the, the emissions that are resulting from the production of the plastics, causing some degree of warming. Yes. That warming affecting ocean acidification. Yes. But the, the plastics that are generated as a result, polluting the ocean, possibly reducing the effect of the carbon sink in the phytoplankton, so all of these things, acidification, warming, pollution, climate change, and biodiversity are, are linked in some way. So from every perspective, whether it's pollution or climate change, I think the key here is for us to really look at our own habits and how companies operate and how we can reduce um, single-use plastics as a whole. When do we have to get started? 10 years ago. Unbelievable. All of this plastic collected at Lazarus Island in Singapore in an hour. We've got a major problem on our hand. And it's not just a pollution problem, it's also a climate change problem. Because here in Singapore we incinerate everything, we, we dispose of our waste so efficiently, maybe we don't see it, maybe we don't understand how to care enough about this as a climate change issue. But that's what I've learned today. It's serious, it's urgent, and we have to start doing something about it now.
we are more reliant on single-use disposable plastic than ever before. But they're also causing irreparable harm to our climate. How can I get people to pay attention? I feel stuck. I need a change of perspective. Maybe this is the problem. Samakau Island. We see Samakau as a symbol of our success. It's a badge of honor. We incinerate all our waste. We even generate electricity in the process. We seem to have it all figured out. But I wonder if our efficiency sometimes works against us. Because we don't see our waste, we don't realize the scale of the problem. I want to understand how much Singaporeans know and care about our plastic addiction and the climate change problem it's creating. So I worked with CNA to commission a survey. We spoke to 1,200 people, asking them all kinds of questions about climate change. After three months, the results are out. What I found was that nearly half of the respondents didn't realize that plastics is a climate change problem. OK, so our awareness isn't quite there, but there is a silver lining. They were quite clear on what they had to do with the single-use disposable plastics after they were done with them. 65% say we recycle, which cuts down on the fossil fuels needed to make new plastic. Over 60% know we have to empty out food containers. and drink bottles. Seventy-two percent know we can recycle egg cartons. But bubble wrap? Only one in two know that. OK, so our survey shows that we kind of know what to do. But here's the thing. According to the National Environment Agency, only 4% of all plastic in Singapore gets recycled. Only 4%. Compare this to Hong Kong at 12% and Taiwan, a whopping 73%. What accounts for our measly 4%? There is only one way to find out. I'm headed to the Sem Waste Materials Recovery Facility. Every day, about 70 tons of stuff is collected from municipal recycling bins and sent here to be sorted for recycling. Glass, paper, metals and plastic. I've asked to see what happens to items collected from my constituency in Pungal. And I've invited some Pungal residents to join me. This is what was delivered earlier. This truck has just come through, having picked up recycling material from 240 bins, including in Pungal, from your homes. OK, so there's four and a half tonnes worth of material from the blue bins that it has picked up. It, it smells like... Garbage. garbage. Yeah, it's like, almost like rotting food. It's quite disgusting. Do, do you recognise any of the stuff that you recycled? What is this? This all can be recycled. So the metal can? Can be recycled, but the contents inside cannot be recycled. So this is contaminated uh, on itself. We can't recycle the whole product. <coughs> and that contamination has affected other things as well? Yes, that's right. I found a food packet. Food packet? Yeah, I think there's rotten food inside. Here, again. One rotten pack of food can easily contaminate everything else in the same recycling bin. 
the grossest thing I've seen is diapers, actually. Diapers? See the bulky waste, like the, the child seat. Child seat? Yeah, that, you, can't, you can't put them into the recycling bin because you can't recycle this. Uh, in, in this facility at all. Even if they were to dismantle it, there's still a lot of other metal parts in there, and, like the belts and, and the cushion and all. So what's yeah, going to so happen to this? It's going to be considered rejected, the bulky waste. So it's going to be brought uh, for incineration or uh, landfill. Sem Waste doesn't do any of the actual recycling here. What they do is throw out the obvious junk, the contaminated stuff, and send the rest to the recyclers. Once the plastic is sorted, they are stacked together. Two days' worth of bin collection, and this is all the plastic considered fit for recycling. From 140 tonnes down to just two tonnes. So these bales get shipped off to someone else? Yes, uh, either locally or overseas. What, what makes you so sure? Yeah, the reason I'm asking is like yeah. when people put them into the recycling bin... Yes, yes. They think those are going to be recycled. Yeah. But what I've learned today is most of the things they put into the recycling bin is not recycled. Yes, yes. So I'm just wondering whether that problem extends down the supply uh, chain, you know? Okay, okay, So okay. you think all of this is going to be recycled. Yes. And then you ship it out somewhere, but actually it doesn't get recycled. Basically, right, so these are the salvage lots that we will actually bring them for further recycling. Yeah, so they will definitely get recycled. Well, that was unexpected. And it turns out that almost all the plastic that we throw in the blue bins ends up in the incinerator. We can't easily recycle our way out of this problem. We simply have to cut down on the use of disposable plastics. But that's easier said than done. I just had to look at our production meals. A lot of disposable plastic is imposed on us, whether we like it or not. Plastic is still the default when you order delivery. Wow, look at this. That's a lot of plastic for just one meal. And we're only in the first week of filming. Imagine what this will look like when we get to the end of our project. In just three weeks of filming this climate change series, this is the plastic we accumulated from production meals. Frankly, I'm a little surprised how quickly we filled up this pretty big box. To be fair, the food delivery companies have made small steps. The biggest players, Grab, Food Panda and Deliveroo, no longer give out plastic cutlery. You have to ask for it. It's a move that saved one million pieces of plastic every week. But cutlery is just one part of the problem. What about the other plastics we get in our delivery? So I asked for a meeting with Grab Food to find out how they're tackling the issue of plastics in uh, food delivery. So here I am, and I brought with me a little present. Grab is not the only food delivery service in Singapore, but it has the biggest market share. We've really enjoyed the convenience of this, but it just appears a bit excessive. There's lots of bits of plastic. Uh, is there something we can do about this? I, I totally agree that this is something that we really need to do. And I think Grab, given our scale and size, uh, we have the ability to kind of nudge consumers and merchants in the right direction. So one of the things that we're going to do, we're going to do this trial where we're going to encourage merchants, instead of using plastic, to use eco-packaging um, when they're doing food packing. This is the eco-packaging. Sustainable, compostable alternatives made from paper and bioplastics. And it seems like I've come at the right time. Grab is about to run a trial. And how it works is we've worked with uh, one of our partners, Biopack, to provide eco-packaging to our merchants at a much reduced rate. In this trial, customers will get to choose if they want their food in the eco-packaging or in the plastic containers. And is there an increase in cost to me as a consumer? Because eco-packaging is way more expensive by multiple times than plastic, um, the merchants will have the options to charge consumers um, for that increase in price. Um, and at the same time, consumers must be, must be willing to take this as an option. 
in my opinion, I do think regulation is something that needs to also catch up, right? So I do think regulation is going to be a very big factor in making sure there's mass adoption. Why do you think regulation is so necessary? Um, many reasons, but I think most importantly, eco-packaging just costs more. And I think if regulation isn't there, it is a disadvantage for merchants who have to sort of like absorb these costs uh, versus merchants who are not eco-conscious. It's, it's very unfair, so I think their business will be impacted. Grab will be running the trial for a month and I'll be checking in with them later. Meanwhile, I've got bigger fish to fry. I'm speaking, of course, of Singapore's enduring love for plastic bags. About 70% of us profess to be utterly reliant on them, far more than we are on plastic food containers. I'm hoping to end our love affair with plastic bags by showing Singaporeans the scale of the problem. Can you guess how long it takes Singapore to use this number of plastic bags? According to the Singapore Environment Council, we take 820 million plastic bags a year just from supermarkets alone. Hi, everybody. I'm breaking that down and showing Singaporeans what that looks like. We have 260 plastic bags here. Can you guess how long it takes Singapore to use this number of plastic bags? About 10 days. 10 days. Three. What do you think? Less than a day. Less than a day. I'm going to say about two days. Two days. Uh, for me, one. One day? Yes. A minute. A minute? Less than a few hours. hours. A few hours? Yeah. yeah. A few hours. A few hours. OK, it takes 10 seconds. <gasps> As a country to use up 260 bags, it took us 10 seconds. Wow. It's possible for us to stop using it, but I think it takes a lot of commitment. 260 plastic bags in 10 seconds. And that's just the ones we get from supermarkets. So I thought I'd ask the group CEO of Singapore's largest supermarket chain, Fairprice, what can be done? I don't have a good name for this prop, you know. We were struggling whether to call it like the Great Wall of Plastic. I think Wall of Shame is good. There's just too much plastic. Uh, well, we all need our plastic back, but this is clearly too much. In 2019, Fairprice began a trial in 25 stores to see if they can get people to use less bags by making them pay. The trial ended in November 2020. I'll say there are a big majority. In fact, 70% of the, all the shoppers supported this. Over this one-year period, about 50 million bags were saved. 15 million, million bags plastic bags were saved? Yes. Were not used? Were not used. Personally, I'd like to have seen Fairprice be bolder. At the larger fair price outlets, shoppers who took bags were charged 20 cents per transaction, while the charge at the smaller outlets was 10 cents. Mind you, it's per transaction, not per bag. So why design the trial in that way? Why per transaction, for example? Well, first of all, we want to make it also administrative easier. Imagine if I have to count the number of plastic bags. Your trial is only at certain outlets, right? Why not all your outlets? Uh, maybe we'll get there, but like commercially, it hurts us. What do your employees think about this? When we implemented this, some of our employees got abuse. Got abuse? Abuse, yes. Some customers felt that it's their right. They felt that this is part of the cost of doing business. They paid for it. We shouldn't be charged. I so see. there were some ugly incidents. Fortunately, this was just a minority. Why is Fairprice doing this? Every corporate needs to exercise their social responsibility. So for that, uh, we've done it, we've come out. I must say I'm a little bit disappointed that the rest, uh, whom I thought would come along, haven't come along. We seem to be the only one leading this charge. Uh, so I hope, I really hope out the rest of the players out there, big and small, come along. How can we get there faster? I don't know, do you have the answer? Help me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stumped too. Our survey reveals that only one in four of us brings our own shopping bags when we are doing groceries. Fair Price will extend its trial for another year, which I hope will continue to make a difference. But even if we did choose to go plastic-free at the checkout counter, the truth is disposable plastic is a problem even before we get there. Just look around on the shelves. 
Today, almost everything in the supermarket is wrapped in plastic packaging. While we do reuse the bags that we get at the checkout, the same can't be said for packaging like this. It's cheap, it's easily contaminated, it's low value. The recyclers don't want it. So this disposable food plastic packaging is a problem, and we've got to do something about it. What's your favourite veggie, Sam? Ah, we're supposed to get carrots, right? I've asked Pungal resident Peri Anayaki and her three kids to help me find out just how difficult it is to shop plastic-free. Ah, I need tomatoes, baby. Yes, I plastic. like tomatoes. Plastic moment. Yes, but everything's plastic, baby. You see anything there that we can take? Meanwhile, I've sent Lemon and her mom to the local wet market at Pungal. Here, items are sold by weight and without much packaging. But it's Lemon's first time at a wet market, and she's as curious as I am to see if it's really that easy to go plastic-free. It's actually very challenging to you know, go to the wet market without taking any plastic bag, huh? to be honest. Oh, so this plastic box is actually from one of the kopi tiam that I tap out. So I actually washed it and then keep it and then use it for this purpose. Let's go get the egg first. Yeah, that's the one. 190. Yeah, this is 190 and this is 320 for six. This is 12 for 190, right? Yeah, 190. But because plastic. Uh, yep. Yeah. Right, because yeah, it's environmentally friendly. But so it's more expensive. Problem. So which one would you pick? That. As economically friendly mummy or <laughs> big. Instead of like, you know, those plastic, those eggs that is already pre-packed, we actually go go for those loose eggs and then we select those very good one lah. Then we use the paper box instead of plastic. Yep, okay. Hi, how are you? Okay, so how did you go? How did things go? You've got some supplies there for us. This is not plastic, that's good. Okay. okay. Then this is plastic. Okay, so eggs came in plastic, some fruits came in like cardboard. Oh, drinks, milk. Mm. And this was the vegetable. Right. Tomatoes. Okay. okay. So I told them that I actually don't need plastic, then they were, then where are you going to put your <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did they give you a discount? No. <laughs> Not really. How did you find the supermarket challenge, Skanda? Would you change the milk that you drink just to have a brand with no plastic? Yeah, but I don't want to change. You don't want to change, <laughs> all right. Yeah. You're quite I stuck would, on the... I but I can't. You can't. What about you, Lemon? You, you want to go back to the wet market again? Uh, not really every week, no. to be very honest. In terms of like pricing, I'm actually quite worried. So like for the meat-wise, they will say that, hey, I need to weigh before I can like, tell you how much is the price of the meat. But how do we really no, know? The way, no, yeah. So you, you like the fact that actually when you buy something, it was pre-packaged and pre-labeled, as it were. That gives you some reassurance. Yes. I see. That's what you get from the supermarket. Yes. But you don't quite get that from the wet market. Yes. And of course, so <laughs> and of, of course, the I mean, it's very hot. If I shop in, I need aircon to you shop. Did, you didn't enjoy being there. So that's why you hadn't been in a wet market before. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> right. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. Wet markets may have an edge on the packaging front, but supermarkets win on convenience, comfort, maybe even trust. So what can they do about packaging? I'm back at Fairprice, this time to speak with Grace Chua. She oversees the supermarket chain's packaging decisions. Look at this, Grace. Uh, I mean, don't you think this is a little bit excessive? That's a, a tough, hardy vegetable. Does it really need plastic packaging? Here in Singapore, more than 90% of our products come from many parts of the world, from China, Malaysia, Thailand, even as far as Australia, New Zealand, or the Americas. So packaging actually plays a very important role in preserving the quality and freshness from the farm to the table. So if you look at vegetables that are sold loose versus vegetables that are pre-packed, the shelf life extends from four days all the way up to 16 days. So from a food security standpoint, it actually allows us to source from many other countries far away from home to make sure that we have the products that we need to feed our population. 
But you know, some of these things, I can buy this loose in the wet market, right? They're not in plastic packaging, they're fresh. What's the problem? Why is it that they can, we can do it in the wet market, but in the supermarket, yes, that's it's a very good question. So actually, globally, pre-COVID, we have started to see supermarket retailers test out offering more fresh produce loose. What we have seen, though, is that a good 50% of consumers still prefer to buy the products in the package form. Why do they do that? So, particularly with COVID, hygiene concerns has become, you know, something that consumers have been quite conscious of. You wouldn't know how many people have already touched this bell pepper, for example. Is, so, it, is it customers that are the problem then? So, actually, mishandling in store does happen quite a lot. When products are sold loose, people pick and choose, you know, they touch the you know, products several times, products are tossed around, they fall to the floor, and this actually leads to food wastage. How much food wastage? When products are sold loose, we see as much as 10 to 20% of food being wasted. And when they're packaged? About 2 to 3%. 2 to 3%? Mm -hmm. So it's up to 10 times more wastage Correct. The, with the loose? Yes. So, so the plastic solves a food wastage problem, you try to fix the food wastage problem, you have a plastic problem. Correct. So. Spot on. <laughs> But what if we can go beyond plastic altogether? I'm about to discover some pretty futuristic and far-out solutions that will shock you. Huh! Ha! It's like nothing. It's like there's no heat at all. On my journey so far, I've met ordinary people and businesses who are trying to cut down on the use of plastic. Here's a thought. Why not overturn the way we make plastic? Remember I told you that plastic was invented in 1869 to replace the increasingly scarce elephant ivory in billiard balls? Plastic was created to protect our natural world. 150 years on, human inventiveness has taken us full circle. In our search for a sustainable alternative to plastic, scientists all over the globe are now looking back at the natural world for inspiration. In the UK, plastic is being made from fish skin and guts. In America, it's mushrooms. And in Indonesia, seaweed. While in Singapore... Oh, it's like wriggly, warm, wet, and smells of ammonia. I'm here at a black soldier fly farm. You might be asking why. I'm told that this is part of our solution to our plastic problem. Shiva, these are your babies. Absolutely, a lot of them. What's going on here? These are not flies. These are not flies. These are actually the larvae of the black soldier fly. Okay. And as they grow, they shed their skin which is full of a magic material called chitin. So chitin is the most naturally occurring, one of the most naturally occurring polymers that could actually replace plastic applications in the real world. So why black soldier flies? The black soldier flies have one of the shortest life cycles in the insect world. So uh, from the time the eggs to the time they're harvested, we are looking at about 23-day life cycle, and I that's see. really quick. So the turnaround time is very important. The other beauty about the black soldier flies is that they eat food waste. So not only are we solving the plastic problem, we're also potentially solving the problem of food waste that ends up in our landfills and in our incinerators. I see. I must also mention that the black soldier fly is native and indigenous to this part of the world. So the cost of growing these, farming the black soldier flies is the lowest in this part of the world. I see. Globally. I helped Shiva harvest the exoskeletons that were left behind when pupae emerged as adult flies. This is full of chitin. So we sieve it, clean it up, and collect it here. And send it to Professor William Chen at NTU next door, where he does his magic and makes it into plastic. This is really intriguing. I know that chitin is a substance called a biopolymer that's already used in the making of medicines and fertilizers. But this is the first time I've heard that it can be harvested from insects and used to make plastic. I've brought a box of exoskeletons to Professor William Chen. Professor William Chen. Hi, how are you? 
Professor Chen has built a career combining food science and engineering. Still, I wasn't quite prepared to see him mix the exoskeletons with banana peels and apples. Turns out the fruit acts as a food for microorganisms that will help ferment the exoskeletons. Chitin can be isolated using chemicals. Let me see. But uh, doing so is a lot of uh, very energy intensive and then also produce toxic substances in the process. Fermentation is, a, in this case, is a biological way of getting chitin out of the insect as a skeleton. But let me show you what we have done successfully on prawn shells. Prawn shells are also an excellent source of chitin. And this powder is chitin that has been extracted and dried from fermented prawn shells. Prof Chen tells me chitin is a versatile and strong molecule, properties that make it an ideal plastic substitute. To transform it into a plastic, Prof Chen mixes it in a mild acid, pours the solution into a mould and lets it dry in the oven. So this is your dried film product? Yep. OK. Which I can't... Oh, wow! So it looks like plastic, it feels like plastic. Excellent. Can it be used for food sort of wrapping? Yeah, that this is what we're aiming for. What we're aiming for is to not to reinvent the wheel, to so, uh, tap on existing manufacturing processes and uh, to feed in the powder into the current plastic manufacturer's machine. So this is, this is scalable because it uses the existing manufacturing process? Exactly. So that in a few years' time, we'll see this uh, plastic alternative on the supermarket as well. A few years? OK. I'm looking forward to it. Compared to plastic from fossil fuels, the film I'm holding in my hand is a much more sustainable material. And thanks to the use of fermentation, this option is much less carbon-intensive, much more climate-friendly. I really hope that Professor Chen's invention takes off here. But what struck me was his point that this needs to be easy for manufacturers to adopt and scale up. Because at the end of the day, for great ideas to make it to market, you need industry on your side. It's the same principle with recycling. When global oil prices are so low and it costs so little to make new plastic, if you've invented a way to recycle plastic waste, then you've got to find a way to really sell your case. And that's exactly what Professor Duong Hai Min has done here at the National University of Singapore. He's discovered how to transform cheap and plentiful plastic drink bottles into a truly profitable product. A process that begins by shredding plastic bottles into a fine thread. Ah. Where are we going? Welcome to my kitchen. Your kitchen? <laughs> OK. In his lab, or kitchen, Professor Duong mixes the shredded plastic with a chemical solution and freeze-dries them overnight at minus 35 degrees Celsius. The result is an ultra-lightweight and highly absorbent material called an aerogel. Oh, so this is aerogel. OK, it, it feels like a piece of fabric, but it's very light. Yes. Almost like a piece of felt. Like you can still see some of the fibres coming off it. The people, they don't want to recycle the plastic way because they don't believe the value of the raw material. So I believe in the raw material, convert them into the aerogel. They have got a very high value for the multi-billion dollar uh, application well, market what, as well. What value is uh, a cloth like this? One of the major applications is will be for the oil spill cleaning. So we am going to pour about this the motor oil. Now, this is the aerogel. We usually coat it with the water repellent. Okay. So you can see this one. We put it on the top, yeah? This one here. We just leave it for about 15 seconds. Okay. Yeah? So that, that is how we look like. So you can see I'm going to turn over about this one as well, yeah? Wow. So you can see. Wow. There's no... Huh. Oil look on at the that. top of the water. So all the oil has come up into the aerogel. Aerogels are widely used to clean up industrial oil spills. Prof Duong's aerogels, made from plastic bottles, are seven times more absorbent than commercial alternatives made from silica. And the best part, because it's so simple to make, they are ten times cheaper to produce and result in a lower carbon footprint. Goodness, look at that! Yes. 
Why are we going outside? We're going to play with fire. Play with fire. Okay. okay. So the bottom is burning? It's burning. The temperature is about 500 degrees C. What, so, what? General, mm -hmm. put on the top of this. Try the, put my the hand top, on top surface of this one. Yes. It's like nothing. It's like there's no heat at all. Is it? Uh, so okay. it's 500 degrees underneath. Yeah, and the top of this one will be about 32 degrees C. It, 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 feels, like the... it feels like the same. Yeah. Aerogels don't just mop up oil spills. They are also great as heat insulation. I'm excited to see the uses that the plastic from PET bottles can be put to as a result of Professor Dong's research. But there's another thing that PET can be recycled into. Clothes. Let it go. Let it go. Throughout the filming of this show, I've been wearing an entire wardrobe made with, believe it or not, recycled PET bottles. Let it go. This shirt is 12 PET bottles. This shirt is 20 PET bottles. Even my shoes have recycled plastic in them. There's seven PET bottles in this pair. This is a small answer to a big problem. But just like Professor Dong's decision to focus on high-value aerogels, if fashion can create a market for recycled plastics, it's a start. And a market can only take off if there's demand. For the past four weeks, food delivery company Grab has been testing its customers' appetite for plastic-free eco-packaging. Turns out, 25% wanted it, even if it meant paying an extra 30 cents for every piece of packaging. It's encouraging, though I do wish it was higher. But if there's anything I've learned, it is that our behaviour is not set in stone. Think about how we now instinctively wear a face mask when we leave the house, or how we step to one side on the escalator all without a second thought. We can be persuaded, motivated, even compelled to do the right thing. And when it comes to plastic, we really need that push. We really need to do this. Reduce consumption, invest in new technologies, pressure our businesses. And if it comes to it, be prepared to pay a price. For our future, I think it's worth the fight.